I always like to ask this question so people can hear directly from you. Are you racist? Uh, well, <laughs> let's get to some serious stuff here, Grums. You have had a target on you the last, I don't know, month or so, you know, since you've sure. really kind of uh, come out against all the uh, stuff that you've gone come out about. And I'll tell you, before we get into why you've had the target on it, why don't you just briefly talk about your overall stance in, in the video game space right now and uh, why people have had a target on you? I, I want to fix gaming. And, you know, Cabrutus came out with his Sweet Baby Detected um, curator group, which is over 350,000 strong now. Uh, you know, bless him for that. Uh, and, you know, it really sort of um, ignited this sort of uh, awareness about how, why games are changing. And gamers have, so many gamers have come to me and said, I had no idea this was going on, but it explains so much. And because over the past, you know, a couple of years, we've seen our beloved franchises kind of trash. We've seen uh, the defeminization of uh, female characters. We've seen, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, swaps of whoever the heroes in the story get swapped with a, with, you know, either gender swapped or race swapped. And people are wondering why this is happening. And I, I wanted to explain what was going on from everything that I knew because I wanted to see the focus on gameplay again. I wanted to see good stories, even good diverse stories. I think that's an excellent noble goal. But the problem is that for my friends in the industry, DEI has been weaponized and they don't feel safe in their own studios. They can't be creative and they are basically at risk of cancellation at any moment because they might have a different opinion. And I think that's wrong. And I think we need quality AAA games again. And the only way that's going to happen is if we get rid of this stuff. So you've been pretty outspoken on uh, on X about this, um, you know, pointing out uh, people within the industry, not necessarily developers, but uh, community managers, uh, various uh, people who are within the industry, whether it's media, people who uh, are have vocal, who, who are who have voices in the industry that uh, have gone out of their way to, I don't know, spread a narrative or be uh i don't know kind of talk about that a little bit well i i do two things one is i write twitter threads about what's going on in the industry with esg how esg works how dei works what's it like to work in these studios and i did and the community manager stuff really started uh I think uh, just last week where I spent a couple days talking uh, about a story where one uh, AAA community manager came forward to me and, and talked about a secret group, a private group, not secret, a private group where community managers got together to coordinate. And, you know, that's fine. I can see professionals coordinating. But what goes on in this group is, is not fair. It's not good. Uh, basically, there is a couple of community managers, a lot of them actually browbeating everybody else and threatening them with reports to HR if they uh, break rank from this narrative, you know, this progressive narrative that they're pushing. And uh, and they don't feel very comfortable. And, and, and this particular person left because of that. Uh, and it's gotten really bad. And it's not enough to be silent. Apparently, you cannot just sit there and say, hey, I disagree, but I'm not going to say anything because if you're silent, you are complicit. And that to me is a cult. Right. And so everyone is expected to say the same thing, think the same thing or else they're going to be reported to HR. And they sit at a very pivotal role. People don't really know what community managers do, but they are the interface between gamers and the developers. Developers don't have time and execs don't have time to sit in Discord and forums and, and everything else just to see what's going on. They rely on their community managers to report what's going on with the gaming community. And if you have biased community managers or activist community managers, that's going to get filtered. The execs are never going to hear about they don't like the female character in the game because you made you made them with a beard or whatever, right? And uh, instead, they'll be told, "Oh, it's just a couple of trolls," or and and we should just ignore them. And it goes the other way too. Community managers set the policies of what you can and can't say, or have a large degree of input in them, and they also enforce those policies about what you can think and say in chat rooms, and what's acceptable politics and what's unacceptable politics. And they have free reign to ban and nuke threads and everything else with very little supervision because that's their authority. That's their ballywick. So yeah. 
I thought it was important to highlight this story. And as soon as I did, people started sending me the accounts of some of these community managers. And all I did was retweet what they said. And it was pretty vile sometimes. It was, you know, very anti-gamer explicitly. Why are you hiring a community manager that hates gamers? It was anti-white and it was anti-male. And this, and, and so I basically did a libs of TikTok. I just posted it, right? And, lar and largely without comment. Uh, and for that, that really kicked the hornet's nest. As soon as I did that, I was, uh, I was, I was elevated from, you know, I don't know, DEFCON three to DEFCON one at that point. All right. So, and we're going to talk about, uh, you know, kind of how you got on, you know, because you, you had went back and forth with the Kotaku, uh, website person. And you know, I, I have a hard time calling anybody who works on a, on a blog, a journalist, um, just to be clear. Um, so you went back and forth with them, but it wasn't until you started, you know, uh, at least taking notice of the community managers that you got on other people's radar. Um, and so, and you've been called racist and homophobic and transphobic. So I always like to ask this question so people can hear directly from you. Are you racist? Uh, well, <laughs> that's like, you know, uh, enthusiastically, that, that's a loaded question, right? It's because it's, it, it's, it's something that they really like to throw around. You're an ist, yes. right? No matter if you if you have anything to say about this and you don't toe the line and carry the narrative, they'll throw everything at you. Uh, you know, first of all, I I, I was born in Taiwan. Uh, I'm not uh, a white guy. Uh, I am half white. My dad is uh, white, and my mother is Chinese. But I spent my life growing up overseas, and that's my background. And look. I want, you know, representation in games. That's cool, but make them good characters, make them unique characters. Don't try to erase old characters or swap them or just, and, and don't have this vindictive attitude where you're trying to destroy the past and try to tear down beloved characters. Um, you know, like in suicide squad with Batman and how they treated him, you know, just because you're trying to push a point, I think it weakens the, I think it weakens your point when you can't create anything new, but you have to attach it to something pre-existing and completely change it. That means your, your argument isn't strong enough, and it is strong enough, but you got to do it right. And there are games that do it right. And there are games that also don't bash you over the head and try to make you feel like a horrible person. Games like Baldur's Gate 3, right? Lots of diversity in there. Nobody cares. Focus is still on the gameplay focus is still on great writing and they're not trying to you know hurt any other uh race out there the paler shade as i call it and uh and i think that's where they need to go and we need to go if we want quality representation in games so if you say that then you're automatically called a racist because you have to be in favor of everything even the shitty ideas to promote diversity and that's wrong and that's killing games Okay, so in the last few days, I would say uh, Nick Calandra, who has been on the show, who was on our show um, after they left uh, Escapist, or left or was fired, I don't quite recall what it was, but uh, they left to uh, start Second Wind, and he is a co-founder and editing, editor in chief of Second Wind, and uh, they've gone on and seen uh, some great success through their Patreon um, for people backing them. Uh, he's kind of had you in his eyesights the last uh, last few days or so, and he put out a, uh, a a thread talking about your your you know the game that you're working on right now, Ember. You can see the logo on your uh, VTuber shirt, and um, you know he kind of called this out. He says, "I think my favorite thing about Mark Kern is that his third failed game, Ember, has an option to buy a founders pack for up to fifteen hundred dollars. His little army." Uh, that wants wants him to be the savior of games would milk uh, his little army that wants him to be uh, be the savior of games would milk them for all the money they've got. So uh, he links to this and these various. Uh, I guess what are these? Explain that what these page are. is not even on our website link. Right, you can't get to that page because we took those packs down uh, last year as we're doing a soft relaunch, and you got to question the timing of this. It's like, okay, I started to talk very publicly about community managers, and I started to post what they were actually saying 
And these guys are all friends, okay? These guys all know each other. Remember, community managers are, are, are adjacent to marketing and they interface with these people all the time. You got to wonder why now? Because they went from Mark Kern is nothing and his games don't matter to be like, Mark Kern is number one menace and look at this. And, uh, and I'd never heard of this guy before and people started sending me stuff and I just kind of ignored it. Uh, but it got louder and louder. So I was like, okay, I don't like to talk about Ember because I don't want to show it, but let's talk about Ember. So let's pull that up again. Let's unpack right. that one. The, the actual, the actual tweet that was put Yeah, up? yeah, yeah. That, that, that first tweet. Okay. All right. So, you know, first of all, third failed game. All right. My track record is many, many multi-billion dollar franchises. And I take issue with the, and the games he's talking about are start, are start with Firefall, right? I did not ship Firefall. I left six months before that game ship and they totally changed it. It's not on my bio because it's not the game that I made. And when they did that, because the Chinese owners wanted to make wow with guns so that they could sell it to additional investors, when they changed it, everybody started to really miss the beta. And that's when I presided over the design of that game. They say I made the best version of Firefall there was. So if you look just at timeline math, it's impossible for me to have failed at and, uh, at Firefall because I left six months before it shipped and the game did not and studio did not close until two years later and they made numerous and they completely changed the game they made numerous changes during uh, the time it was live and they ruined the game and I wasn't even there so that's just basic math so that's unfair first of all to pin that on me the second game they're talking about is a VR MMO that we briefly uh launched and it was too early i mean the the cheaper version of the oculus wasn't out there great project had a lot of promise but it you know it uh it went to crowdfunding and it failed and that happens sometimes investors we had we didn't take any money from 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 gamers right we had investors there that had pledged up to one million dollars but you got to remember, a pledge is different from actual funding. And a lot of that pledge was contingent upon the success of the crowdfunding, which just unfortunately didn't happen. So real quick, which game are you speaking of? Uh, that would be the if you go to his next tweet, mm -hmm. I think it's there where he talks about mech. How about uh, this one right here? This is a continue continuation of the thread. From, oh, okay. From, he talks about that a little later, or someone replied to it, and that's the number two game, right? So that was a voxel, uh, voxel-based, you know, sort of like uh, Minecraft MMO light type of thing, and uh, and we had private investors for that. We had two private investors for it that had pledged up to that amount. Uh, contingent, a lot of it was contingent upon the successful crowdfunding, and that didn't happen. So, but it was a great project, a great team. Uh, sometimes these things happen. You know, things don't get funded. Right. So and the third uh, one and the yes. third one he's talking about is the current Project Ember. And that's the one that I think, you know, my community is all fired up about because they are upset about him uh, talking about it in this way, especially some of my backers. You know, we have a, a super chat in here. I wanted to make sure I pulled this up. He is asking about where did I just had it? I want to make sure I had it. Uh, well, there's this one from Worthy One says, Hey, Grums, sorry, I got to go through this, man. Real ones know you mean well. It's not rocket science. You just care about the well being of gaming. Thanks, Worthy One. Appreciate that. Uh, there was a question about, oh, here it is right here. It's from Black Cat. It says, Grums, can you explain what happened with tight, with uh, Firefall and Red Five? Uh, since you're now on Ember, how can you uh, reassure those wary of past project challenges? Because Firefall and was awesome in beta and everybody loved it and in fact the reason ember exists at all is because the fans of firefall who hated what the ship game was what they changed and how they ruined my design they ripped out my story they even changed the logo these were expensive changes to make i have to imagine that it was out of spite and when they did that people were like what the heck happened to firefall we missed this game and so they started a petition that said hey let's go ahead and, and start a spiritual successor to firefall and i said ah nobody wants that 
It's like Firefall has gotten so much negative press over the past two years that they as they ship crap that nobody wants that. And they said, no, we do. I said, OK, you know what? Let's do a website. And so I did a little crowdfunder and I said, like, what's the least amount of money I can ask for? And I was like, 250. Let's do 250. But the limit on Indiegogo was 500 bucks. And so they funded that like, I don't know, like two grand or something like that. And I'm like, OK, OK let's see where this goes and let's do, let's do a website. And that was the only goal of that fundraiser. So we did a website and forums and then we started getting people and more people and more people. And so I was doing a tabletop at the time and I said, okay, maybe um, this is what people really want. So let's make it a, a multimedia project where the tabletop will tie into the game. We'll focus on the game and then we'll come back to the tabletop and we'll do uh, we'll do a novel series on it too. And that's how that whole thing started. And as far as, you know, what happened at Fire, uh, uh, with Fire, Firefall and Red 5, that, that's a big story. And I don't think we've got uh, enough time to go into that. But it was, uh, you know, uh, like you said, just look at the timeline. Do the basic math. I wasn't even there. So let me kind of um, expand on that a little bit, right? Uh, They're asking about the, the uh, you know, the kind of what can you do to reassure people about Ember? Right. And uh, I think Can a lot you? of people would say, say oh, you know, oh. You, oh, you've uh, you know, you've had money contributed up to this point. People have backed it. And, you know, some people say, well, you know, there's there's uh, what, what can you show me? What has been done for this game? Do you, you want to kind of talk about that and kind of give people a timeline on? Yeah, the game? let's what, talk what about that, because you know, if please. listen, uh, the problem I had with crowdfunding was everyone does a crowdfunding for a game and says, we're going to raise money for the game. And they do one crowdfunding and, that, and that's it. And they're supposed to make an entire game from it. That doesn't work. You can't raise enough money off of one Kickstarter or Indiegogo to make an entire game uh, that unless it's like like a really basic game, right? Yeah. So it, we, that's probably why they, I, and I'm, I'm just speaking out of turn here, but I think they, uh, I, I've seen, for example, we were talking earlier about Battletech. Battletech yeah. did a Kickstarter for a game they wound up having to go with a publisher to make up for the funding they didn't make from the Kickstarter, even though they did really well on the Kickstarter, you often need more money to get across the finish line. Is that about the size of it? That's exactly it. And I had a big problem with Kickstarters that were promising an entire game off of one Kickstarter. So I said, let's break it. Let's use the publisher model. Publishers fund game on a milestone basis, month to month sometimes. So you're supposed to deliver or six months at a time as dev cycles got longer. You deliver a slice, they pay for it. You deliver another slice, they pay for it. I said, let's do that with backers. And that keeps us more accountable too. So on our Indiegogo M3 uh, milestone, if you want to pull that up, that was a milestone to do some very specific things. We were asking for $20,000 and we said, this is one of the fundraisers we're going to do. We're going to have 10 of these. We're going to have 15 of these micro milestones that each one funds. And if we're doing our job, then you'll fund the next one. And if we're not doing our job, then you're not going to fund it. And that says everything. So if you scroll way down, keep going. This is all the good news where we had, we talked about all this uh, unlocks. If you scroll all the way down, you'll see, all right, scroll up. And uh, you'll see what we were, uh, oh no, sorry, go down again. <laughs> so this was a very specific milestone and we were supposed to deliver a couple of key assets. And we did. Ye Keep going down. Yeah, sorry. So Keep you feel down. That you, you feel like you delivered on on this uh, this Indiegogo. Yes. So uh, scroll up from here. Mm -hmm. Past the image. I'm I'm sorry. I should have like given you the image. Uh, scroll down again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tell you what. So this had a very specific goal, right? And you can see how we explain milestone-based funding here. And we were supposed to deliver uh, a working a working mech, uh, male and female characters, one gun, single player, and some stationary targets that you can shoot at. That is done, right? We that is that is something that we delivered four years ago. And so this Indiegogo is closed. People say, oh, you didn't update the Indiegogo. Well, that's because everybody moved to Discord. 
Nobody talks on Indiegogo anymore. And we talk to our backers on Discord and they're all there. And you can post that link in chat and people can join us. And you can ask the backers themselves. So the idea was that we break it up into these mini milestones. And we actually completed that Indiegogo. And then we were supposed to come out with the next milestone. The problem was that I lost track of sight of that plan. I was like, okay, because what happened was a couple of things. We had COVID hit and that really decimated uh, our productivity and our team. We didn't know what was going on or what the future was going to be. And the other thing that hit was crowdfunding for, uh, for games dried up on Kickstarter. It, uh, around right about the time we did ours, it was gangbusters. Uh, you know, people promising MMOs were raising two, three, ten million dollars, you know, with the with the back end included. And that all dried up. Nobody was funding Kickstarter games anymore. So we said, oh crap, what do we do now? Because we wanted to keep going with these independent fundraisers. So we ended up putting backer packs on our site and we said, you know, we have to raise the bar. We have to go farther than what we delivered on Indiegogo in order to be competitive because people aren't going to back us unless they see something much more, much more like a demo, much more something that you can play. And that was the goal. But the problem that I, and the mistake that I made was it was too big for a goal. We're all part-timers, right? I'm the only full-time person there. And the goal was too big and we abandoned the mini milestone model and we tried to do too much. And to be honest, you know, without like an Indiegogo or Kickstarter, you can't create that buzz for funding those milestones. So we were trying to do way too much. And at that time, we continued to deliver demos. And can we run the game footage in the background? Because the other thing we're accused of, is sure. there is no there is no demo. And there is. So you can see here, that, here. Yeah, you're looking at uh, at Ember. Uh, one of our ember builds and you basically see that we've got multiple weapons we have missile lock we have instead of stationary targets we have moving people and we have uh, up to 100 players in this map and we've had 100 players here and we had this and we said we can't go to kickstarter with this we have to we have to do a graphics overhaul we have to do more gameplay in order to do it and that's when i think we went astray and it was compounded when um two years ago i had and i don't like to talk about this i had medical issues with my family multiple members of my family life-threatening medical issues i was at the doctor and labs two three times a week uh i've had my own health issues and for two years we struggled with this to figure out what was going on and what was happening and luckily things are better now but during that time you know, when you have a part-time crew and it's only me holding everybody together, if something happens to me and my family, it's not like I have a giant company that carries on in the background, right? Uh, and so that's when we didn't have any real updates aside from technology demos for two years. And that's, and when things got better last year, I said, okay, finally we can proceed. And I talked to the community. I apologized to the community and said, hey, um, this is, this is not going right. And we need to do a reset here. Just like no man's sky did a reset, just like final fantasy 14 did a reset at the indie level, we've got to do a reset. And so I said, we're taking down the backer packs and all those packs that he's talking about are gone. And I said, we're going to focus on gameplay. And when we have new, we have regular demo drops again, we're going to turn the packs back on or we'll come up and we're going to focus this time on coming back to our milestone based funding. So yeah, this is not a fund once and go. Uh, no game can fund itself just from that. And that's why you see so many failed Kickstarters. We were very clear from the get go that this is milestone based funding. And we had very tiny bite sized pieces that we would fund as we went along. And that's what we're going to go back to. So let me ask you this. In the upper corner, you saw that the uh, the date on that was, uh, I think it was 2021. Yeah, March yep. 19th, 2021. That's that's three years ago now. And I can hear yep. people saying, Well, like, well, it's 2024, Grums. Like, yep. like what do we what do we have? Like, I don't can you talk about the timeline on on when the next demo would be released so people can see it for themselves or play it for themselves? So and 2021 was the last time you saw this demo, but we released technical demos in the meantime because we started taking it apart. We upgraded it to Unreal 5. 
uh, we swapped the terrain for voxels and we said, we're going to focus more on less on the graphics and more on the functionality. So we had, we did release builds after this, but it has no graphics. You're talking about white ground. You're talking about, you know, very sparse graphics. And we, in some cases we actually have cubes for enemies because this is what we call white boxing in the industry. Before you dedicate a lot of time to finally polishing graphics, you go back to just boxes and squares and we share we share the sausage being made. So we come out there and we don't hide our development builds. But unfortunately, that's what the reporters are cherry picking in order to say there's nothing here. Uh, and I think that's unfair to pick a white box prototype uh, and it's, to say that this is it's unfair, man, it's unfair for entirely different reasons. They are forcing you to go out into the weeds to justify the development of your game because you've been critical about a completely different subject altogether. It is a yeah. classic distraction tactic is what it is. It's to watch the birdie, go look at this instead of looking at this perfectly valid thing that he pointed out. You could be the biggest scam artist in the history of the video game industry and still be completely correct on this issue. It's laughable. It's a completely a diversionary tactic. Yeah. And that's why I invited people to our Discord. It's like, listen, uh, you're not going to believe anything that I say. Go talk to our backers. You know, we've had our ups and downs. People know exactly what's going on. We're very, very communicative with our backers, and they know everything that's going on. Go talk to them. Join our Discord. And our Discord has been so positive and so uplifted by all of this that everyone's excited. So we're currently working on, you know, like I said, we have different tech demos and things out there. One of them is an art revamp. If you show some of our... Um, I think I sent you links of one of our characters, um, yep. the, the Feli character, as well as the the enemy units that we upgraded from what you saw in the demo. These are these are much higher quality than before because you have to be competitive in that space. Oh, not this one, the other one. Yep. There we go. So this is a Feli character that's rendered in engine in Unreal, but it's with upscaled textures. So you've got 4K textures and the hair is not rigged. I get complaints like, oh, that's just a sculpt. That's not the real model. No, that's actually the real model. It is rigged. You can animate it. I pose that character myself. The hair is the only thing that's sculpted there and not rigged because I'm still not sure of the hairstyle. But you can see that we're vastly upgrading the graphics quality here. And you can switch over to the other video I sent you about the enemy units that are uh, that we have. And these are actually animated. So you, there is a uh, test demo you can download, and you can actually pilot this guy. And then we have swarmers, and we're working on technology that lets us do horde mode, where we can render hundreds of thousands of these little guys on screen at the time. Uh, because we are a, a kind of like planetary war game where you've got 100 players PVE versus monsters. So this is what we're doing. It's like, okay, we got to up the quality level. We got to put this into a new demo and get it out to backers. And I think we're looking at about a quarter here. I'd like to get something out to backers in the next three months and then break it up into mini milestones again. Uh, the original vision for how you fund, how you how to properly crowdfund a game and keep crowdfunding projects accountable and instead of trying to do this huge monolithic demo at one go we're going to break it into little pieces and fund it that way so as far as a uh, let's let's just put like a, i know we only have a minute or so left with you at grum so i want to be uh quick and ask a, a question i think most people would want to know is like okay then what's a timeline and on a real like a realistic release date for for this game is this uh 2025 2026 you know and um kind of here's talk what about i say that. here's what i say so w once we have these mini milestones they're ultimately supposed to lead up to a kickstarter that is provable that people can download and play and that kickstarter would be the bulk funding to start the company right and the success of that kickstarter the amount we raise determines the final scope of the game and the release date I can't tell you how long it's going to take till I can tell you how many people I can hire, right? And no one's full-time right now. So that is what our backers know. They say when Kickstarter starts and we do the raise, then we know the interest level, then we know the funding amount we have, then we can lock down the scope of the game and we can lock down the team size and that's when we can give you a release date. But honestly, you know, we're doing an MMO light. This isn't like a huge MMO. And Indiegogo doesn't even talk about it being an MMO because we've had a hard time pitching the idea of what this game is like, even starting with Firefall. We struggled with do we call it an MMO or not because 
it, we're, we're not MMO based combat. We're shooter first. We're action oriented first. And hell divers came out and gave us a very nice boost because we could say, imagine hell divers, but instead of a galactic war, it's a planetary war and you're fighting over zones in a map. You're pushing them back. You're unlocking them and they can push back against you. And it's you versus a massive AI in, in you in power suits and mechs versus a massive AI enemy uh, with that, that uses Kaiju and war beasts instead of tanks and planes. And that is something that we can communicate now. And you can see that that's a meta layer. It's kind of an MMO light layer on top of it. Uh, no, no, we never do raids. We never do dungeons, nothing like that. So that is, uh, I think, the, the, the long and short of it. And I think that uh, this, uh, this Nick guy uh, gets a lot of things wrong. But I think Asmongold's interpretation in his video was very fair. He said, basically, that, listen, there is an obvious bias here. And it's not wrong to ask for money because if you're going to crowdfund something, you have to do backer packs. And of course they picked only the, the two most expensive packs out of like 12 that we offer. Right. And this is something where um, he said, listen, there's an obvious agenda here, but the game's taken too long. And Mark Kern needs to answer for that and explain what's going on. And so that's what I'm doing here today. We made a mistake moving away from our mini milestone goals. We still delivered stuff. We delivered on our Indiegogo. That's done. Long been done years ago. We didn't break it down into many milestones there. And for the past two years, I had to choose family over the game. And it was a very hard decision, but I'm very glad I did because everyone is okay. And I think coming after me for my kids being sick, for me being sick, is a low blow. And I think that that's entirely politically driven. So if I could give the middle finger right now in my avatar, I would. Go fuck it's politically yourself. driven regardless. Like all, like I said, all this is out in the weeds. All of this is forcing you to justify something that is completely beside the point. If you were a layman standing on the street who didn't develop games, you still would be completely valid in your criticisms and you would still have receipts to back them up. So it has nothing to do with the game. Everything I say is their own words. Uh, reports from inside the industry. I'm telling what's going on and they're bringing in something completely extraneous into this. And actually I don't mind so far. I said, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to call Ron. I'm going to raise a legal fund if you step out of line. And then I retracted that because I was like, oh, actually this is going great. The community is galvanized and pulled together and we're more motivated than ever to, uh, to make Ember a fantastic game. And it's going to be a fantastic game. So let's close with this. You, you, you were kind of going there, but I want to I want to give you a, you know, the time to if you could have a direct message to those who are, you know, coming after you who say, hey, you're attacking you're attacking those community managers. What would be your direct message to them? Look, all I'm doing is posting what they're tweeting themselves on a giant social platform. If that is something that they don't want people to see, they shouldn't be sharing it with the world. And people need to know about this because it is something that directly affects game development. People say community managers have nothing to do with the game. Actually, they do because they are the interface between gamers and devs. They filter the information up and they control what information gets disseminated down and they police, ban, and moderate the communities themselves. That's a lot of power to influence the game. And this is not a place where politics yeah. and DEI should be. This is a place for neutrality. And, you know, I'm not saying fire these people. You can move them into marketing. You can even move them into producer roles. These, these are both paths that I've seen, you know, uh, but get them away from gamers. Yeah, this is not the first time this tactic has been used, by the way. I did a video called Hollywood Was Always Red that went through the history of some of the ideological years of Hollywood in the 30s and 40s. And one of the ways that movies were skewed wasn't so much that they put communist propaganda or whatever into movies. It wasn't really that. It was more so that there was a script writers union that was affiliated with the American Communist Party or with the Hollywood Communist Party. And they would get the script readers to read particular scripts in Hollywood and sort of nix things that had things that they didn't want to appear in movies. And slowly over time, you started to get more of an ideological bent there. So the gatekeeper, this kind of the low level gatekeeper 
winding up affecting the overall quality of the final product is old, old tactics. It's just moved into the digital age, it sounds like. Yeah, I, th this is a, an ancient playbook, probably laid down by, if you follow the conspiracies all the way back, laid down by the Soviets, right, back during the Cold War. That video has been going around, and it's shockingly accurate. <laughs> All right, that? guys, I do have to take off. Yep. I, you know, uh, you know, we could talk more about this. They're lining up hit pieces right now. Uh, I imagined a, there's going to be a focused, coordinated assault either end of this week or early next week. Uh, and, um, you no, know, dude, we this, uh, these screenshots right there, I could tell you they scream what we witnessed in the Battletech community, where in this private server that people were paying attention to community managers and whatever were literally just digging up the dirt on all the social media on the person. Oh, here's a screenshot of this. Oh, here's a thing that you could hit them with. This sounds like the opening salvo in that. So I think you're dead on the money on that. Yep. And I ain't going to stop. They can keep trying, but uh, these are important issues to talk about and you know, they're not going to have any effect on me whatsoever. So well, thanks to everybody. Yeah, for sure, Guns. When those hit pieces come out, buddy, we'd love for you to come back on and we we'll continue the conversation, man. Appreciate you. Sounds good, man. Thank you for having me.